hitting broadcast in three, two, one. Um, all right, good evening or afternoon or morning, <clears throat> wherever you are. It's been a really lovely day in Boston today. Wonderful weather, Lo really great evening. We're happy to share it with you. Uh, welcome to the second of three opening events this month. My name is Jeffrey Burchard. I'm a partner at Machado Silvetti, an architecture and urban design firm in Boston. I'm also an assistant press professor in practice at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Uh, and I helped to organize and host this event with the fantastic support of the Boston Society of Architecture. The idea for a lecture and conversation series, as I mentioned uh, last week, about new architecture that's opening soon comes from the Vernissage, a French term from the 18th century used as a description of a kind of a preview of an art or architecture exhibition before a formal opening. In other words, it's a time for people to get a tour of something that's not quite finished. The last pieces are being put on and there's still some possibility that something fundamental or exciting might happen before the opening. I really wanna thank Danny Solomon from my office for these graphics and a big thanks to Caitlin Hart and Billy Craig and Natasha Espada at the Boston Society for Architecture for helping to put on this event. Last week, we had terrific conversations with Nadir Tarani and Eric Howler. Uh, that has been turned into a video and is now posted on the BSA website. This evening, we are joined by Beth Whitaker and Matt Odens. Super short introductions of each. If you'd like to find out more about them or their firms, you know, Google on the side while this is going on. Everyone's presumably looking at an internet connected device. Uh, Beth Whitaker is founder and principal of Merge Architects, based in Boston. The office works side by side with the client and teams of fabricators, artists, craftsmen, and engineers to produce an architecture that embraces the art of making within a larger agenda, that is to redefine the urban and social boundaries in and around the city. Beth is also an associate professor in practice of architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Matt Odins is a founding principal of Odins LO Architecture, also based in Boston. The office is skilled at creative, innovative architectural solutions that respond to their specific physical and cultural context and reflect a close collaborative relationship with each client. They are architects committed to a sustainable future, as we all should be, considering every project with respect to its impact on the natural environment. Each uh, Beth and Matt will have 15 minutes to present a single project that is opening soon, and then we will have 15 minutes of discussion. There will be a Q&A uh, function available. If you have questions, uh, please put them there and we will try to get to as many as possible in the discussion period at the end. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth and ask you to share your screen. And uh, thank you again, Beth and Matt, for joining us this evening. Thanks, Jeffrey. Can you see my screen? You got it. OK. Hang on. Um, OK. Whoops. OK, thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you for inviting me for this super cool event. Um, <clears throat> totally game for this. We need some optimism in this insanity. Uh, I'm, it's 7.05 right now. Can you tell me when five minutes is up? Because, we'll yeah, because I'm, <laughs> I, got, I got a lot. Um, and I'm going to do my best. And I know you're going to cut me off in 15. So. Yep. Um, because I want to spend a little bit of time kind of obviously giving you the context of the project as we do, um, but also to really tell you about the organization that this project is all about. Okay, so Grub Street. This project is um, a, a new narrative arts center for the, the Boston Seaport. 
they are not a new group. Grub Street was founded about 20 years ago, a little more, I think, by Eve Bridberg. She's amazing in a one room Arlington space. I don't remember all the details. And she's grown it into this crazy awesome um, organization. It's a writer's organization. And they have workshops, they have groups within groups, they have conferences and so on. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but it is an interior. So I know last week Eric and Nadir showed buildings, um, which are great, beautiful presentation. Um, we have an interior for this project. So I don't know, we might be the only interior for this whole series, Jeffrey, but I think it's a really important project because it's opening in the fall. It is a postponed opening um, because of COVID, because of a lot of things. And it's a, an amazing offering, let's say, to the city in that it will be a public space in the seaport um, at a storefront space and location. So with that, a little bit about Grub. We call them Grub for short. Um, they call themselves Grubbies. Uh, and they are in um, their whole DNA is uh, a very, very, very inclusive community, um, in incredibly diverse in every way. And their outreach is to just about every community in Boston, um, including uh, many of the underserved. Um, and so this is just a view of their existing space where I think they've been I think for about 15 years on Boylston right off the common. Um, for those of you who don't know Boston, it's kind of in the heart of the city. Um, kind of a dusty old space that they appropriated. Uh, but what they're about, this is a quote from their website, Grub Street is the place where writers develop their craft. So they are all about supporting folks from age 13, they say to 113, God willing. And they have, again, workshops, they call it a home, various classrooms, and then they have outreach spaces throughout and or, uh, events throughout the city. Um, they are not publishers, but they have a lot of authors that do get published. They're very supportive. I think one of the stats was they had over 65 of their authors get published within one year, a year or so ago. So that's amazing. And they're interested in people finding their voice. They are storytellers, story makers, story listeners. This is a little logo of an uh, annual writers conference that's called The Muse that apparently has become the number one writers conference in North America by Writers Magazine, I think they might know. And thousands of people come together in Boston um, to this conference. I think it's a three-day conference that has seasoned writers, new writers, panel discussions, workshops, and so on. So it's pretty great. This is another organization called YOP, Young uh, Adult Writers Program. It starts at age 13. My 13-year-old is taking her first workshop there in two weeks. Of course, it's online. Um, soon to be in the new space. And they have uh, scholarships uh, for homeless children, et cetera. So I urge everybody that's tuning in to really look into this group, Grub Street, um, and get involved any way that you can. This group is their uh, writers of color um, within the organization as well. Um, and we uh, worked with all of these groups, different spokespeople from these different organizations within Grub Street while we were designing. I think we had over 27 workshops for this 14,000 square foot space with various folks um, from these different groups within the organization. Again, a snapshot of the existing space where they are that they've now outgrown. Um, they moved out, I think a couple weeks ago and they're all of course have been working remotely anyway for the last couple of months. And so there was a really cool RFP that the city put out um, for the, this 14,000 square foot space, which is at the base of a high rise on the seaport, on Boston Harbor, in the seaport, along the Harbor Walk. I'll show you a map in a minute. Um, but because of chapter 91, which is a mandate that protects the public coastline to stay public for the city, um, there was a piece of this very fancy steel and glass high rise um, that has extremely expensive true luxury condos above the storefront space that the developer had to promise and keep and was required to give um, this 14,000 square foot space to a nonprofit within the city because of this chapter 91 uh, law that's put in place. And I won't go down that rabbit hole, but it's pretty incredible. And they've had a lot of support, including the mayor. They went through a long RFP process. I think there were over seven or 10 nonprofits in the city that competed. Grub Street obviously won. In five um, 
Five minutes, okay. And the mayor, um, this is just the mayor saying, when I walked into the door here, there was a buzz, which was an event that we held a few months ago to kind of kick off, at that time, the beginning of construction that then was halted. Um, so a little bit about the site. This is uh, just an axon view of where it's located, which is this mid-rise, the one in pink, where, where my cursor is. You see my cursor, Jeffrey? Cool. So it's right here in this corner. This is along what's called the Boston Harbor Walk, which actually extends more than this dash line. It keeps on going. Um, this is the seaport. Uh, just to locate some of you who know the city, it's right across this little uh, body of water from the ICA, the Diller Scafidio Building, um, Institute of Contemporary Art. And our office, Merge Architects, is right back here. So we're pretty close, um, which has made it pretty great for site visits, um, just a few blocks away. Zooming in, it's kind of a kooky layout. We have the first floor, which uh, aligns luckily with the sidewalk, the harbor walk, and the public street, um, pedestrian street, right on the water. And then the upstairs wraps around in this kind of funky L-shaped configuration, which has a little bit of a view in the back of house as well, back out to the water. So the project itself, talking about the architecture and the design, you know, at Merge, we have um, sort of, as every firm, a certain sensibility about form making and materiality. This one was puzzling for us because early in one of the many 26 or 27 design workshops we did with the client group, there was a lot of talk about diversity, inclusion, and how to represent that in architecture, both in palette as well as form making. So we sort of took it back to what we call the ABCs of shape, which are circles, squares, triangles. They also wanted something that was very warm, um, playful, uh, and some, a space that felt incredibly accessible to anyone and everyone. And so we looked at 2D to 3D versions of these shape making and this shape language um, that is uh, sort of deployed throughout the project as both graphics, as well as components, as well as recess niches and so on. And so the plan lays out like this. I'm just gonna walk you through it. Um, and I may have said this before, but the construction was postponed. We just started back last week where they marked up the floors. So we are at early, early stages. It's gonna be pretty fast. Um, and I think we're going to open hopefully early fall. So the, the main floor, which is completely public, it gets a little uh, complicated in a wonderful way in terms of public space, semi-public space, um, and a little more private Grub Street workshop space. Uh, coupled with that, um, they are partnering with a bookstore, which is going to be an in-house bookstore within this first floor, and that's Porter Square Books which is a bookstore in Porter Square, Cambridge. They are not leaving their uh, site there, but they're actually adding and having a satellite site here within the Grub Street facility, which is great. It's gonna be great for the neighborhood. Um, and so programmatically, there's a cafe that hugs that corner that has the wraparound glass. Um, by the way, this is Plan South. Uh, so East Glass Wall, which is this jagged wall, faces that water in the ICA. Then there is the Porter Square books within the space. Um, not highlighted though where my cursor is, is the front door to all of the project. And there's directly ahead is a big stair that takes you up to this dashed um, floor plate on the second floor, which is Grub Street workshops, classrooms, and staff space. That stair was there. We had to work with obviously the shell of the building, but also that communicating stair was a pre-existing stair um, that we had to leave in place. And then at the end of the uh, first floor, which also has a lot of storefront frontage, is what's called the event space. And this is really great for Grub because they can finally have their own space instead of going to like Paradise Lounge or various bookstores around the city to do their um, uh, readings, to do their poetry slams, panel discussions, you name it. They're going to host that here as well as music events and whatever else they can come up with. So because of the sort of interesting flow of this hybrid program, um, it needed to be very flexible. So here's just zooming into the project. So again, cafe, bookstore within the, within the space, and then the event space. 
And so the idea was the event space would not only be an event space, but would then open up and become um, an extension of the bookstore and also just a casual public lounge for the city to come and read a book, buy a book, hang out, have a cup of coffee, anticipate the event that's coming up later in the day and so on. And so the cafe is again using the shape language of these circles and these figures. Um, the big yellow stair is their new branding color. So that that was set in stone um, with the uh, branding um, consultants that we worked with. And then how those pieces play out and um, uh, get utilized as space makers and program zones and so on. These are some tables and et cetera. A few views, this is walking in straight from the front um, door. There's only one entry point, those double doors I showed you. A stair straight up to uh, the Grub Street workshop space, the cafe on the left, and then um, just a, a, a hint of a view of the bookstore, which is in the middle of the first floor. And then spinning around, again, we're trying to use these shapes um, in a very playful but deliberate way that includes signage as well as the volumetric figures, and in this case, the cutout of the cafe. From the cafe, looking back to the bookstore. Um, within the Porter Square Book bookstore piece of the project, there are no walls in terms of like divisions between Grub Street space and Porter Square. It's all one flowing space. Uh, and here you get a glimpse through where we have these pivoting uh, kind of Harry Potter wall books, bookshelves that keep this wide open um, to create multiple apertures between the bookstore and that event space, which doubles as a lounge, lounge space during the day or whenever they don't have an event. And also ex an extension of the bookstore the books for sale from the bookstore. And just a view down to the event space, we have this um, big circular stage, which is raised from the floor, which is very figural in the space, um, uh, that creates a soffit as well as a raised, raised stage. This is obviously a setup um, for an event, like a panel discussion or a reading. And then how these components get reconfigured and the flexibility of the space, both with the bookshelves as well as the stage lounge set up and so on. How am I doing on time, Jeffrey? I got another floor. I think you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, you, you have about two, I mean, two and a half to three minutes. Okay, so that's the first floor of Grub. Um, and just a few views uh, of that um, movable stage that creates a little more uh, space uh, for seating, depending on the event. And then upstairs, which is the heart of um, obviously Grub Street and their workshops, has a community lounge on the second floor overlooking the water. These classrooms spread throughout the main three in the center of the, of the plan, and then the back of house where the staff works at the back of the site. And then this uh, space that at first was going to be a real issue for us um, as this long corridor that we actually created and widened and created crochet that became what we call the social spine which houses all these recesses and nooks for one seater two seater four seater and spaces for people to collaborate um, and kind of spread out casually throughout the space so here's a bird's eye looking down with the community space at the front of the um, second floor so you come up the stair with reception amazing views out to the water. The ICA is off to the right, just to locate you. And then these components and how they shape the space, um, swinging back around, looking at the stair. There's a kitchen that is open to the public upstairs to this community space. And then down this deep corridor, a couple of classrooms and how they combine the back of house. And then the social spine, which is really the hearth of the project, again, has these different depth recesses for the one-seater, two-seater, three-seater, four-seater, and then these deeper threshold moments for the three main classrooms um, where the doorways are into those embedded uh, classrooms throughout the deep plan. A view down this um, social spine in the deep corridor, and then a few elevational um, views of these recessed nooks and how this will be used and kind of um, appropriated throughout the space and back into the back of house um, an elongated elevation showing that social spine. And then we used um, a series of graphics of story arcs um, that we discovered throughout the process through the client and created this super graphic, took some artistic license and um, actually used it as an overlay over the opposite wall of the corridor, which tells the story of the story making. 
um, and then those two areas combine to create this um, main spine and passage that connects the back of house to the front of house of the Grub Street floor above. Whew, and that's Grub. That is great. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> By the way, 15 minutes, one second. Man, was, uh, awesome. Good, uh, you set the bar very high for Matt. In terms I was talking of, uh, fast. Um, um, so uh, Matt, please, please share your screen and looking really looking forward to your presentation. Thank, thank you, you, Beth. Yeah, my pleasure. Can you see my screen? Yes, we, we can see it. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Jeffrey, and thanks to the BSA for organizing uh, this series. Uh, it's a terrific event. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about our project for the Norwell Public Library, which is currently under construction, set originally to open at the end of this year, but uh, with COVID, we'll see how that goes. We're gonna, it's going to be touch and go. Um, uh, certainly, it'll open later, Beth, than, than your project, even though it started uh, uh, just about a year ago, it feels like. Um, over the last 10 years, um, our office has been fortunate to work on the design of uh, 15 public libraries, 13 of those in Massachusetts. Um, and in that time, we've really witnessed the transformation of public libraries from centers of information into centers of culture. Um, in all our projects, we look for ways to strike a balance between acknowledgement that a library is an important civic building with an interest in creating a building that's also accessible, approachable, welcoming, uh, center of community life, engagement, and enrichment. Um, although many of our projects have been in small rural towns, uh, as small as Shutesbury, which is out here just west of the Quabbin Reservoir, um, 1,200 residents, um, they all respond to and are influenced by the fabric of the town or city that they're in. Um, even in the smallest places, they occupy a place that relates to other public spaces and buildings, a town green, a town hall, um, a main street. And in, in turn, we try to look beyond the limits of our site to hopefully make a positive impact on that larger context. Um, as an example of that, and before we get into Norwell specifically, um, I wanted to take a look at uh, another recent project we did in Webster, Massachusetts, which is uh, a former mill town um, in Worcester County. So this is a little southwest of, of Worcester. Um, little known fact, Webster is home to Lake, I'm gonna try to say this, Chargagog Machaugagog Chaubunagungamog, which is the longest place name in the US and the third longest place name in the world. Uh, most people just call it Webster Lake. But anyway, that is Webster's claim to fame. Um, Daniel Webster did not live there, but the founder of the town was friends with Daniel Webster and therefore named the town after him. So now you know more about Webster than, than most people. Um, Webster was interesting because uh, the, the, this was a replacement of an existing library, um, early 20th century, um, that had really outlived its useful life. Um, you see here the existing library which is opposite um, a town green and adjacent to, uh, to town hall. There's a senior housing complex behind that. Um, what's interesting about this is that it's such a visible site um, with a great view corridor along Main Street from the commercial district. Um, a, a difficult site from the standpoint of, of size. Um, there were two houses at the back end, which ultimately the town acquired and they expanded the site to expand parking, but, but the buildable area really is limited to this area, although it's the most visible area and the, and the area that had the most potential in terms of how this building could, uh, could transform that site and uh, really shift the focus. The existing building is entered off of Lake Street, um, inaccessible, up a few stairs, not surprising given the period. And it presented, although a lovely, facade to the green and to the, to the rest of the town, really kind of an inaccessible facade with a mid-level entrance that really had no uh, strong kind of connection, pedestrian connection. Um, and so what we tried to do in our project was really shift the focus of the library to create a front along that town green, turn it 90 degrees essentially, so that you have, um, as this building slips out beyond town hall, you've got a really 
visible, exposed um, facade that relates to the town um, with a two-story glass reading room, adults on the first floor, children on the second floor, a kind of large um, civic scale bay window overlooking the, the commercial center, overlooking the green, and a two-story porch uh, kind of riffing off of the two double height um, porch on uh, Portico on Town Hall, but in a contemporary way, obviously. And managing the grade so that we can get handicapped access up onto then a plinth overlooking the, the park. Um, so as you're coming down Main Street, this is the view that you get. It's a really terrific visible site. And so the, the library really starts to participate in the life of the town. It activated this eastern edge of the public park. Um, it provides uh, nice views from the main reading room back out to the town hall and to the uh, adjacent park and, and Main Street. Um, and, and because it's a tight urban site, uh, really required um, a device to get a lot of natural light into the middle of the plan. And so it was organized around this double height um, atrium space with, uh, with a light monitor and baffles and to bounce minutes, light around. Just, just letting you know. Uh, so then by contrast, moving to Norwell, um, the, the, this is a site that is by comparison, almost contextless. Um, Norwell, if, for those of you that don't know, is a town on the South Shore, just uh, southwest of Worcester, or sorry, of um, Situate. Um, and, and it's really loosely defined commercial and civic centers that aren't related to each other. And this occupies the, the wooded wetland area kind of in between those two areas. Um, closest thing is the high school, but you can see that it's in a wooded wetland surrounded by other wooded wetland um, and unusual from the standpoint that you get to this site and you have virtually no sense of anything else around you but, but woods. Um, we took over, uh, well, a couple of uh, aerial views of the site as you can see from my background. So this is the, the original 1970 building, 8,000 square foot building. We replaced with a 20,000 square foot new single story building. Um, but at, you know, you can get a general sense. And as we move sort of backwards on the site, you can see it just keeps going. And it's just woods and woods and woods and wetlands. Um, so very different kind of environment. Um, we picked up where a previous feasibility study left off. Um, and although the planning was generally sound in terms of arrangement of major program elements, we felt that the, the massing um, fell a little bit short of what seemed appropriate for this site. It was an overly wide, 70 foot wide uh, building, um, each of the wings about 70 feet wide, which really is too wide to, to allow patrons to have kind of a direct connection to the outdoors. Further, the gable roof really made this a kind of inward facing um, design, which required top lighting like, like you saw in Webster in an environment where that, that really didn't seem necessary and we sort of wanted to do the opposite. So um, we looked at a kind of evolution of that concept, a previous concept, first uh, pulling apart the pieces a little more so that they were more identifiable uh, volumes, slimming up the proportions, and then ultimately um, reversing it. There was a, uh, which is organized loosely around an outdoor space, which then kind of bled into the woods. And we thought that it was a more compelling arrangement to, um, to start with that uh, smaller scale um, courtyard space and uh, create an environment that was very different from the context around it. So because there isn't a whole lot of context, trying to in a way choreograph the, the patrons experience from parking through this um, introductory landscape, which is a very different scale, um, lower volumes, uh, different material, um, you know, sort of carefully cultivated, and then into a compressed zone and out um, emerging into reading rooms then that start to uh, expand out and up towards the, the expansive views inside. Um, really delay the kind of sense of pleasure of that discovery of the woodlands. Um, so this is a, a early um, diagrammatic model uh, that, that shows the general arrangement 
Um, and in this uh, iteration, it was more clearly a distinct series of three wings, a children's wing, an adult wing, and a community wing. Um, uh, and you get here a sense of the, the sort of scale of that entry court, um, more compressed, uh, lower scale as compared to the interiors. Uh, the plan evolved over um, a period of months. Um, the, the, the different wings sort of fused together a little bit more and ultimately we settled on a final plan, um, still organized around the courtyard, but gathered under a single L-shaped uh, monopitch roof, the, the adult wing, uh, teen room, staff areas, and children's wing. Uh, with adults and, and children kind of the anchor stores of this uh, of this arrangement and then a separate volume for community access. Um, entry from parking is uh, through a covered entry porch into this main entry with then a view through a periodicals room and out um, a porch and one of our preoccupations in this was creating figuring out a way uh, although libraries are, are all about control um, and supervision wanted to give patrons the opportunity to get outside um, obviously you have the courtyard but once you're in the library how do you get outside again with a book um, in a controlled way and, and given this environment we really wanted to provide a couple of uh, places to do that so directly ahead of you when you come in is a screen porch the children's room has a, a bay a pop out sort of window seat low window seat with cubbies below that they can crawl into uh, that kind of cantilevers out uh, towards the woods. And then the adult wing has this corner um, covered, but not screened porch. Um, and the grade falls away at this corner. So at this point, you're really up about six feet above the forest floor. And it's a nice perch um, from which you uh, overlook the, that context. Um, I mentioned the arrangement general uh, adult program along this side in this wing, uh, children's at the opposite corner. Um, it's a big building. Um, supervision is important, so there's a central circulation desk, but uh, key touch points for staff, uh, both in children's and in, in adults, uh, to, to create visual coverage. Uh, the meeting room is um, in a wing that's actually accessible off hours, so the rest of the library can be closed. This is a pretty common feature in our public libraries because they're really playing a role as community centers. Um, this kind of flexibility of use is really important. And so how does this work when the library is closed, but uh, a community group wants to access it? So we have access to a lobby, potentially the porch, if, if the library is willing to open up the periodicals room. Uh, but lobby, all of the main facilities, um, a small conference room, a cafe, and a meeting room for 120 seats. Um, so it gives them some flexibility and still gives them access to the central garden. Um, a, a big component of this too, given, given the location and this sensitive wetland environment was uh, wetland conservation um, and stewardship. And so we spent a lot of time working with the Conservation Commission and coming up with a plan for how we, we fit a 21,000 square foot building into this context. The green line is the delineated wetland. Um, this is the 50 foot buffer, the red line, the magenta line is a 75 foot buffer, and the blue line, the 100 foot buffer. We are trying to keep this as fully out of that 100 foot buffer as possible, uh, but you can see how constrained the site is. Um, this, if you can make it out, the orange line here is the dashed line that represents the existing limit of disturbance. Um, so what we did was we kept some of that disturbed area by way of driveway and some parking, we created new disturbances here, these darker brown, but then we recreated wetland in areas uh, where, where we were able to, to restore it. Um, and then add uh, bioretention, these darker green, um, as a way to manage stormwater. The, the water table is so high here that infiltration is almost impossible. Um, we have a kind of a constructed wetland courtyard garden then um, that really is a way of collecting rainwater. And in some cases, we're actually scuppering the water off the roof. So you see the water spewing off the roof down into these um, uh, kind of retention swales um, that then allow the water to kind of slowly filter um, through and back out to the wetlands. 
uh, if there ever was one, this project was a poster child for a green roof. Um, sadly, we were not able to convince the client uh, mm -hmm. to do it, but uh, really it would have reduced runoff by at least 30% uh, by our estimation. Um, we're still able to handle all the stormwater through, um, through the, the methods that I mentioned, but um, felt like this was a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, general organization of the building, three-dimensionally, again, the adult wing here, community wing, children's organized around the courtyard, um, the off-hours area, um, and then these are a few views. Uh, this is the approach view as you're coming in the driveway, parking is to your left. Uh, you're just picking up the end of the entry porch here. Community room is in this corner, adult wing is what you see when you drive up. Um, and then an approach from parking lot. The, the material palette is a mix of um, slate and wood primarily. Um, we're using a, a local Vermont green slate. It's an unfading green slate. We were trying to find materials that were durable. This is an incredibly uh, densely wooded property and so it stays wet a lot. And so finding materials that perform well uh, was important. Um, we thought also it should blend in. Uh, initially we were looking at uh, charred timber that didn't go over well with the clients and we ended up with slate which is a terrific uh, material locally sourced. Uh, the green I think really works well in this environment. About, and we, one, minute. About one minute Matt. Okay and then we paired that with a warmer wood uh, started out as Ipe we've now switched to Alaskan yellow cedar at the courtyard. A couple of other views this is the entry porch and courtyard garden adult reading room uh, exposed glue lamb structure everywhere, at least in the main rooms. Uh, we tried to keep that open as much as possible. We do have acoustic baffles in between. You can see them here in the children's wing. Uh, this is the, the corner window of the children's room overlooking the woods. Um, a view from the woods looking back towards the adult wing in that corner porch that I mentioned. And then I'll run quickly through some construction photos. Uh, these were from about two months ago before the job uh, was put on hold. We just started up construction again last week. Uh, the contractor has been doing a great job remobilizing all the subs and uh, everybody's getting back on track. A couple of views from the woods looking back towards the building. Uh, this is down at the children's end. Uh, that middle courtyard. So this is as you're coming in the entry porch, uh, this large expanse of glass will uh, be new materials and browsing with the circ desk here with a great view out uh, into that center garden. This is that view. A view from the makerspace, adult reading room. So all of this will be, will remain exposed. It's all uh, Douglas fir, heavy timber, uh, blue laminated construction. Um, exposed wood decking, which will be visible throughout, although we will have the acoustic baffles that help help us manage things like exposed sprinkler pipes and a conduit, which will all live up above the zone of the baffles, which kind of create a virtual ceiling, but don't completely obscure the, uh, the nice uh, warm wood structure. This is a view of the porch, that corner porch. So this is the view you'll get uh, when, you're, when you're outside. Really lovely context. Um, we sacrifice a few things in public construction, one of which was fully concealed uh, glue lamb connections, but uh, I think in the end, pretty clean and a relatively small price uh, to, to keep the bones of the project intact. Uh, and this is the green slate that is just about to be uh, ready for installation on the exterior. With that, we'll escape. Awesome. Wow. Thank, thank you, Matt, for sharing that. Thanks again to both of you. I think it's, um, I, I admit that, that I didn't know exactly what Grub Street was when I made the pairing, but somehow the, you know, <laughs> the clear connection between the book or writing uh, that's, you know, so much a part of both of these projects makes them quite quite an interesting pair from that, that point of view. I, 
the the Q and A session is you know available if anyone wants to write in questions. I have lots of <clears throat> questions and comments myself, also as I've been taking notes. But we're we're we'll, we'll try to fold in again as many of the questions as we can. I I do just want to start though with a kind of a a question about the status of interior public space, um, of which both of these buildings or these projects are based around. Um, they definitely coming at it from slightly different perspectives, either the kind of regular or let's say normative way we understand the public space of the public library on the one hand, although it happens to be in a site that's kind of difficult to get to versus the space that's deeply in the middle of a sort of roaring urban development. Um, but that is sponsored by a kind of semi-private public partnership organization in which the, you know, the, the impetus for the publicness of that space is slightly different. So I wonder if you could each comment a little bit about sort of current contemporary support structures for public space, natures of interior public space in terms of like incentives to use those spaces, mm. and then sort of the qualities that fulfill that promise of the publicness of those interior spaces, which is clearly a different kind of question than the one of exterior public space, which is also a very important question, but not one that your two projects really are dealing with because those are different kinds of problems. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure if I can remember all of those, um, but I would say, um, and it's interesting, Jeffrey, because the one of the first Q and A question is asking me how to. How do I design inviting and welcoming architecture, especially when it comes to bringing in desired diversity? Yeah. So I think in a way it's a similar answer about how do you design for publicness, <laughs> both in material and inclusivity. We are, it's interesting, Matt, it's cool because we, as Jeffrey said, this is a very urban um, project that we're working on right in the heart of the seaport and along a major, becoming a pretty major pedestrian passage the harbor walk like i've been out there a lot in the last few weeks because i'm i run out of my home screaming at the end of the day after all these zoom calls and it is packed and i've lived in this neighborhood for 17 years i've never seen it as packed along the harbor walk so i'm i'm really excited about that for many reasons so we are blessed with having kind of an audience or a public already right because they're just going to spill in and get a cup of coffee the how do you design for that reading of a space I mean, for us, it was really going back, like I said at the beginning about shape making and trying to figure out what forms were not too elitist, <laughs> what palettes seem to be all inclusive. And I don't have the magic answer for that. I don't know yet what others will feel about it. But we wanted to get um, very kind of um, casual, non elitist, and um, honest and kind of uncomplicated about the way we thought about shape making and space making in this project. There's not any fancy craft, which is something we've been really interested in um, in the past in terms of you know how to be super clever and resourceful with off the shelf stuff. That's not what this project's about. It's about a kind of simplicity that hopefully will seem incredibly accessible to all. We're also, we can't take credit for any of this, we're operating with the um, Grub Street organization, which is, it's really their community that is going to kind of start um, the energy of this space. And hopefully it will grow because of its new location and all that. Um, so th th that's, that's how we approach des designing for diversity. And, you know, the question, the first Q&A question, it's a question that was asked probably for the first four months of the project working with the client. So that's a spot on question and that's, that's how we addressed it. We, we had schemes that were a little more heavy handed in terms of this particular culture or that and so on. And we landed on something that we felt was very much their own, but also in a way oddly neutral um, in a positive way. It's interesting, Matt, maybe I should just let you answer that question rather than loading up another question on you <laughs> that Jeffrey had. But like I said, we have the luxury of having the public already there. And yours is, this is super urban, yours is almost rural, right? So it's all about a, 
very much a destination for your project versus a kind of happening. Yeah, that that is, I think that's a great way to put it. And, and as I said in the beginning, it, it's really unusual for us. I mean, we, um, we don't have that many projects that are so removed from their kind of civic context. And especially for a public library, that's such a part of civic life. And, you know, we, we really like to look for ways that the building um, kind of operates at a, at a scale or a level beyond the, the building itself. So, um, you know, it's not just a library, it's a front porch, you know, overlooking a town green and you can use it even when the library is not open. It's just part, it becomes part of a town's identity and the, the way that people use it. Um, and, and so though we look for those kinds of opportunities. Um, Norwell is a little different because it's a destination. So you're not going to kind of naturally find yourself there. You have to really, you have to make an effort. You have to know it's there and you have to make an effort to get there. But, but once you're there, the hope is that it has a kind of similar use pattern and, and that it's, um, it's as accessible as possible. It's as open as possible. Um, and that allows for sort of different layers of use. Last week, we were talking a little bit about the impact of an existing context on a new design. And you've each spoken about this a little bit, whether it, Beth, in terms of like the given stare in a new building that you're filling in, or Matt, the sort of, um, you know, the first project you showed, the town green or something like this. But I, I also like last week how we, Nadir began to talk about how new buildings create new contexts and they're, and they're forward thinking in terms of making things that are kind of mundane, newly relevant yeah. in, a, in a place. And what I really like about both of these projects is the way yours each do that. So if Beth, in yours, the kind of opportunity to go into the space sit down and look back out towards the harbor walk and everyone walking by is a kind of way to engage the public with themselves and kind of make people aware that each other is their context. I, I mm -hmm. like that a lot. And in Matt, on a different level, I think that's also true in public libraries, which are kind of a place where, where people from many different walks of life and backgrounds and cultures can find themselves enjoying the same place with the same you know, resources. But I think also in yours, it's the way that you place the library in the site where upon entrance from the car, it's more opaque and then it becomes more and more transparent out towards the forest as you get deeper into the plan. For me, that's about a kind of a kind of a reminder to people who are visiting the library of their environment. Right, it, it, so you don't give it to them at the beginning, but then you slowly, slowly reveal it back to them. So in this way, both projects are kind of like re, trying to help people re-see their context, or sort of see their context in, in new and unfamiliar ways. I think that's really well said, Jeffrey. It's funny, that corner of 50 Liberty, where there wasn't a building for so long, was sort of, um, temporarily fenced off forever. Like it's a corner that you never got to be in and look back out to the water. So it's true, the storefront space is allowing you to do that, which we can't take credit for. It's an existing condition. But I think it is interesting, this program, which we also can't take credit for, which is the client, is bringing, by definition, the community with which it already has is bringing a kind of soul to the neighborhood that it desperately needs. I love the seaport, but the seaport is a lot of glass and steel. The seaport is a is Lululemon and some fancy retail shops and some pretty cool restaurants and breweries. So there's some good stuff. There's some dry stuff happening, but Grub Street um, is going to kind of bring something to the seaport that it doesn't have, but also in tandem with the ICA, which is a fantastic institution, but is a little is a is a little is seems a little less accessible to many, even though it's a public museum. So, as architects, we were just trying to figure out where our place was in this whole conversation. Um, and I think for public space, whether it's rural library, 
that Matt's working on or this interior along the seaport storefront space that we're working on. It's about creating places that offer um, opportunities for appropriation. And so that's what we were really trying to do is create all these nooks and crannies and flexibility and objects that seemed like the public could actually recreate and reappropriate for many different uses. I think when things become too defined, it feels a lot less accessible and in a way a lot less public. Mm -hmm. So there's a casualness to that, um, let's say publicness <laughs> that we were really after. Um, and some, some of it's hard to even put into words. It's a little bit intangible, uh, but yeah. Matt, I think that was one of the big changes from the feasibility study through your, the development of your proposal was the way the, the frontal, the, the traditional idea of front, which may be something that you would find more regularly in an urban environment, which you were contending with in the first project you showed, suddenly, you know, it changes its nature when you get out into the forest, right? Yeah, I did. I mean, there is something a little bit uh, like coming in through the back door with this project in a way, um, in, in terms of that arrangement. And I think the feasibility study was, was doing just that. It was putting that kind of space as, I mean, that's usually the destination space, the, the kind of central garden space like that. We saw that really as an opportunity to, to heighten the experience of that context and really kind of make, make the woods the thing that um, is really the feature here. Um, you know, I, in, in terms of uh, use, I, you know, we really try as much as possible to make library buildings be um, as kind of open and um, uh, flexible as possible so that people can use them the way that they want to. I mean, obviously there's structure to that, there's structure to the way the collection is organized, there's structure to uh, the kind of intergenerational aspect of it. and you know, and there are realities that go along with that in terms of safety and supervision. Um, and, and there are kind of uh, tailor-made spaces like a meeting room as compared to a reading room. Um, but, but as much as possible, we really try to create a variety of spaces that, um, that work well together and that people can kind of adapt or, or co-opt in, in whatever way works for them. Uh, you know, we hear the word flexibility a lot in in library planning. And I think a lot of that is because there's been so much change in the way libraries deliver services over the last you know, really 10, 15 years. Um, and, and as I said, they've really witnessed a shift away from a kind of transactional um, way of operating to something that's more community based um, and more about engagement. And, um, and so we, we, you know, we, we celebrate that. I mean, I think that's a terrific way that they become more public. You know, they, they've, they've become more, uh, the, the, the residents take more ownership of them, I think, as a result, which is terrific. Um, we've, got a little, we've got a little bit of time left. I have a couple, I have another question I could pose, but I wonder if you have one for, you know, if you want to comment on each other's <laughs> projects by any chance. Um, I know, I think it's interesting um, because obviously they're not completed yet. Matt, yours is much further along. Congrats. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about this, Jeffrey, putting these slides together. And I don't know if this, is a, this isn't a direct question with Matt, but maybe we just talk a little bit about it. But obviously, all we, all we have to show today, you had a little construction, is representation. And so you know, the, the way, and representation is like a, a whole other two hour discussion, right? But with this we've particular- We've had several times, Beth. <laughs> what? what? A conversation we've had many times. I know. But setting, for us, for Grub and for any project, you know, obviously we work through representation, design it, to present it, to talk about it with our client and ourselves and all that. But the tone of the representation to me is so important. It's, for me, it's not so much about a style of an office, although there is that. It's about the tone of the project. And so we really tried to hit a particular tone with this representation that represented <laughs> the kind of space, not just physically, but a kind of 
positive, optimistic, um, again, accessible and cheerful kind of kit of parts approach, not just to the design, but the way that we represented the design. And so, Matt, I thought yours was on that note, very interesting and, and um, really lovely, the way that it represented nature within the architecture and the architecture, the materiality of the architecture and the way it was represented in the renderings was very sort of soft and subtle, which to me really spoke to the environment of the site. And maybe that's the way you're doing all of your libraries, whether they're urban or not, but there was something that really resonated with me with which the way that you represented it and the, your design approach and conceptual approach to this particular project. So it's not really a question, it's more just an observation. Um, I, you know, I, um, I, I, I hadn't seen your project before and I was immediately struck with that uh, first image and the graphic quality of that and the, uh, there was a playfulness and, a, and this, this kind of sense of celebration, um, even the, to the point of the, um, I love the description of the, sort of boiling it down to primary shapes and then using that as a kind of pattern language throughout. I thought that was terrific. But even in the graphics, the kind of confetti of that diversity um, it, as a background, you know, the circles and squares and triangles, um, just graphically, I thought helped sort of get, and, and I think that there's a playfulness to the interiors too that, um, that I really appreciate. Um, I love the, uh, I love that corridor with the individual nooks and the, you know, you, you can choose whether you're a square peg in a round hole or, <laughs> uh, you know, I thought that was, that was a great, uh, really active corridor. Uh, I think that'll be well used. Thanks. The confetti, a little shout out to Eli Logan in our office who worked on that. Zainab Galen, a major designer in this project and Kyle Barker, who's the PM kind of leading the role. They never get mentioned, right? The team. Good. Sorry, Jeffrey. It's good. Couldn't help it. It's good. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, all right. Well, this has been a really, really great evening. I think we're going to try to stick to our schedules and you know end on a timely manner. Um, I just want to thank again uh, Beth and Matt for joining this evening, and um, you know I love that you showed these two projects because they're both tr uh, truly open projects that we can all go see and experience um, when they're when they're completed and I'm really looking forward to uh, forward to it. Uh, we will be back next week for number three of uh, the June series. Um, by the way, we are organizing another run in August and perhaps later on in the fall. Uh, so thank you for your continued interest. Uh, next week, I'll be presenting a project at Pomona College in Claremont, California. And Philip Chen, uh, principal at NDEHA, will be presenting a project they're working on at Harvard University. And next week, the host will be Natasha Espada, who is the current president of the BSA. With that, thanks again. Look forward to seeing you all next time and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you, Beth. Night.